Well, this evening, uh, we're going to look at uh, the first book of Samuel. Uh, and we're going to read from chapter 7 uh, through to chapter 8, finishing at verse 22. So I'm going to read, starting at verse 13 of chapter 7, uh, and just to repeat, we're going to conclude at chapter 8, 22. So in the first book of Samuel, uh, we uh, look at the verse which begins. So the Philistines were subdued and did not again enter the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Israel and Samuel. The cities that the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel, from Ekron to Gath, and Israel delivered their territory from the hand of the Philistines. There were peace also between Israel and the Amorites. Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life, and he went on a circuit year by year to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mizpah. And he judged Israel in all these places. Then he would return to Ramah, his home, and there he judged Israel, and he built an altar there to the Lord. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba, yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day forsaking me and serving other gods, so they're also doing it to you. Now then, obey their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and some to plough his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards, and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants, and the best of your young men, and your donkeys, and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your flock, and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, No, no, but there shall be a king over us, that we may be like all other nations, and that our king may judge us, and go out before us to fight our battles. And when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey their voice and make them a king. 
Samuel then said to the men of Israel, Go, every man, to his city. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so very much for your word. Without it, Lord, we would have no wisdom, no direction. And we would have no guidance. Lord, in this passage, we see that you are guiding Samuel uh, in what for Samuel was a great trauma. But he turned to you uh, and he sought out the wisdom that you gave him. Lord, we thank you again for your word. Forgive us, Lord, when we forsake it. Forgive us, Lord, when we do not delve deep into your word day by day. Thank you, Lord, for brothers and sisters in Christ who encourage one another here in Cornerstone. Thank you, Lord, for our pastor, Jonathan. May he be with his family refreshed during this time of holiday. Keep them safe. May they recharge their batteries. Uh, may they come back, Lord, uh, full uh, of vigour uh, and spirit. Lord, we bring the congregation of Cornerstone, the members before you and friends uh, who we know who join us each Sunday. Uh, we pray for each and every one that each brother and sister and child in Christ, Lord, would know your presence, would know your urging in their heart, Lord, to come close to the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we study this passage this evening, we do pray, Lord, uh, that you would open this up to us, that our eyes may see what you have to show us and our ears may hear what you are saying and that we would not misinterpret this. In Jesus' name we pray.
So Samuel, I don't know what you think of Samuel, but it seems to me that when we go through the heroes of the Bible, we think of Abraham and Moses, we think of Daniel, we think of David, and it seems that Samuel's um, not talked about a great deal, but really he is one of the greatest characters in the Old Testament, uh, and he was around a long time. Uh, and although he is getting old and grey, as he says to the elders uh, here in chapter 7 and chapter 8, he actually doesn't die until uh, chapter 25. So he's around and leading uh, Israel and behind the scenes when Saul becomes king uh, for a considerable period of time. Uh, you might say that Samuel had an enormous impact uh, upon uh, this period of um, history. So let's have a look at the background of the chapter, if we might, first, before we get into the, the detail of this. Uh, you know that Samuel was born to Hannah, uh, who had promised uh, to give uh, any child that was born to her to the temple, uh, and then he could be brought up under, under God's word and under the teaching of Eli, who was the chief priest at that time. Eli was, uh, as the priests were then, the unofficial leader of the Israelites. Do you remember how the people of God suffered under the Philistines? Uh, you go back just a few chapters uh, and you'll read that. In those earlier chapters, yeah, you read that the Philistines even took possession of the ark. They seized towns and cities in Israel. Uh, they captured and occupied uh, these places. These were towns that the Israelites had held since entering Canaan. Uh, and the Philistines raided the land continually, and they stole livestock, they killed livestock, and worse, they killed men, women, and children of the Israelite nation. Now, of course, the Israelites didn't fare too uh, well when they took the ark. Uh, we know the story there. Now, after taking the ark, they had to send it back, and that's when Eli died. Uh, and after that, Samuel uh, comes onto the scene. After Eli, Samuel became the leader, uh, the unofficial leader, not a king, the unofficial leader uh, of the Israelites. Uh, we actually hear very little about Samuel be between the time of him being called by God uh, in Eli's house. Uh, and this particular section in chapter 7, uh, when we read that the people under Samuel are said to have turned back to the Lord, which is quite encouraging. Samuel was Israel's chief priest, their leader, their prophet, but I repeat, he was not their king. But under Samuel, and under his leadership, they subdued the Philistines, they drove back and made peace with the Ammonites. And there was generally for many years peace in the land. Samuel taught the people the ways of God. He brought them back to their true king. He travelled all around the country, of course, teaching and preaching. Uh, we read those three towns that he particularly went to so that the people would never have to travel too far to hear him. All the people had the chance, should they feel uh, that they wanted to, uh, and of course they should have gone, but all the people had the chance to listen to Samuel. But the passage tells us that whilst Samuel was going around the country and preaching God's work and telling the people how they should live, there were great disappointments in Samuel's life. There were several. Um, this passage is a story about how Samuel dealt with the disappointment. Now, um, let's see if we can find an illustration to see how this feels, how this looks. Perhaps for the younger folk, it might be the disappointment of examinations. It's not easy to judge a person's character, is it, from success 
a grade A student passes all their exams, off they go to the university of their choice, they walk straight into a good job after getting a good degree and they do well. Is it easy to judge a person's character in those circumstances? Of course there'll be trials and tests in anybody's life along the way, but success is usually easier to deal with than failure. Now if someone fails to attain, uh, to attain the grades that they want, doesn't get into the university of their choice, but we are perhaps more likely in those circumstances to see a test of their character. We may see more of that person's character. Now, a relationship may not prosper uh, as you wish. That's a disappointment. How do you deal with that? A job might not be all it's made out to be. There's disappointment. How do you react? Samuel had taught the people that God was their answer to all things. If they remained faithful, God would be faithful to them. He would protect them from their jealous and fearful neighbours. He would enable them to prosper. But he was more than their protector. God was their king. God was their king. And so we stumble onto chapter 8. Why did the elders come to Samuel? Why? And as we read this book, uh, it is our instinct, isn't it, to feel critical of the elders. Uh, request in chapter 8, verse 4. We associate our response to the response of Samuel. Samuel was very disappointed with this request. When the elders say, give us a king to lead us, Samuel's annoyed. He is grievously disappointed. But look at the preamble to this request. Despite Samuel's um, teaching, uh, his example both as a leader and as a father, he had two sons, Joel and Abijah, who were to succeed him as leader if the Israelites would we read that they were not as he was. They were sent to the south in Beersheba uh, and were there supposed to lead and judge the people. Uh, but we read uh, that they unfortunately were not honest. They were corrupt. They accepted bribes. They perverted justice. They didn't do any of the things that their father had taught them. So the elders seeing this may well have had some justification in being worried about the legacy of Samuel. We can't allow the nation to be led by these two. We need someone who will lead us well after you go, they say uh, to Samuel. We need a king. Nonetheless, Samuel was shocked and disappointed. Samuel did what we should all do in these circumstances. Uh, he turned uh, to God in prayer. Samuel travelled the length and breadth of the country telling the people what God had to say. He repeatedly told them that God was their king. Samuel was the voice of God, a very faithful and true voice, but God was their king. Samuel also judged for Israel. He set a court so he arbitrated according to God's law. And Samuel had also set up colleges, if you like, or establishments where uh, young people uh, became followers uh, of God's ways, prophets in the land. Every man, however, they say, has his price and his sons had their price. They did not follow Samuel's ways. Uh, they were not like their father. Samuel did not have a price. But it, it wasn't just about the sons of Samuel. The people wanted something that they could see. A monarchy is what they wanted. A majestic king um, that they could serve. Something that they could actually see. Samuel knew there was only one majesty. Samuel knew that was God. But he couldn't get through to the people. 
Samuel knew that this wasn't God's will. But it is the same today. It's the same today. Often spirituality is not enough. The deeply spiritual Christian doesn't need anything else other than that relationship with Christ. Do you remember last week um, Jonathan talking about that uh, from Matthew chapter 7? That challenging section, that challenging passion, uh, passage about Jesus telling the people, not everybody who calls me Lord will come into the kingdom. It, it, it is the person who has the personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And Samuel here was trying to tell the people that you need no more than that personal relationship with God. Our relationship with God should be all and Christ should be all that we need. We do not need to seek experiences to convince us or assure us of our faith or to add to our faith. Some Christians, and Jonathan has, uh, again has preached on this, some Christians have talked of an addition to their faith, a second blessing. It is completely and utterly unscriptural. It is a searching for some extra experience. God was all the Israelites needed. Samuel knew this. He came to God, just as we should in all such circumstances. Uh, and he prayed. Interesting, however, in the book of Ecclesiastes, there is a warning about prayer. Do not be quick, the passage said, with your mouth. Do not be hasty with your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth. Let your words be few. Now this is not a passage which tells us that we should always pray um, very short prayers, um, but it does mean that we shouldn't babble in prayer, and it does mean that we should be very careful. Um, one theologian uh, I read said, we should never come to God without meditating on our prayer and filling our minds first. But we should go to God, and this is exactly what Samuel did. He says to God, why, Lord, do the people want more? Can't they just be content to enjoy communion with you? A, a king? Oh, Lord, not that. Surely not that. Samuel wasn't hurt personally, at least I don't think that's what the passage tells us. The people weren't actually rejecting him. They were actually rejecting God. He was traumatised. He was terribly disappointed. But in prayer, God spoke to him. Samuel was deeply troubled. His heart was in a terrible mess. But if you look at the opening ten Psalms, it's all about where to go in times of trouble. Just as we go to Christ, just as we went to Christ and opened our hearts when we were saved. Samuel knew there was only one majesty, and that was God. Samuel knew that this wasn't God's will. Forgive me, because I picked up the wrong page. and love for us when we were first saved. And Samuel then heard God speak. God says, they're rejecting me. They've done it before, they'll do it again. So give them a king. They're not going to be content with just a spiritual king. They want to see a human king. And isn't it amazing how 
the king that was chosen was an aesthetic king, a handsome man, a tall man, a man who stood out sore. That's what the king wanted. And that's what the people wanted as their king, their human king. But God knew Samuel's heart. God knew how troubled he was. God is a sensitive, tender and sympathetic being. And he is tender, sensitive and sympathetic to Samuel. The Lord Jesus Christ is the perfect representation of God. He is God. God the Son. And we saw all the compassion and tenderness that any human heart could have uh, for a fellow soul when he walked this earth. God is full of compassion. He gave his only son to be nailed on the cross for us by people who were filled with hate. We should not be surprised, therefore, that God is sympathetic with Samuel. He doesn't tell him off. Both God and Samuel knew that this wasn't the answer. And Samuel just couldn't accept it. That's notwithstanding the fact that he knew in his heart, of course, and his mind that Israel one day, one day would have a king. It says so in the book of Deuteronomy. Hannah also speaks of a king in her prayer, in her song. But Samuel couldn't accept it now. Surely, Lord, not now. Not a king now. God says to Samuel, go and tell the people, go and tell them, they can have their king, but you tell them that they will get the king they deserve. God said, the king would claim his rights and, remember this, as one writer puts it, isn't it ironic that just like us humans, God gives us a life of freedom, but we demand slavery. Listen to the words of Samuel to the people. You can have your spiritual king, he'll look after you, he'll protect you. Be faithful. And he'll be full of integrity. But if that's not enough, that's what God wants, of course, the spiritual king, looking after them, protecting them, faithful to them, and full of integrity. But if that's not enough, you may have your king, but it will come at a price. The king will take your sons, we read all this, to serve in the army, some will take their life in their hands and run in front of chariots. Others will be required to work 24-7, as we say, for the king and plough and make weapons of war. Daughters will be makers of perfume. They'll cook for him and they'll cook for his courtiers. And you'll be heavily taxed. You'll have your fields taken away, your vineyards and your olive groves. He'll take a tenth of your grain and it'll be distributed amongst all his courtiers. We might say in this day and age, the hangers-on. <sighs> there will be officials upon officials. There will be crony upon crony, as it were, all seeking to jump on the back of this uh, gravy train. Uh, but the passage goes on. Uh, we read it earlier. I wonder if Samuel in his own heart thought that the people would yield at that point. God had said, no, <laughs> they won't. They will want a king, despite you telling them all this. I wonder what was in Samuel's mind. The people had come to him, and only him, when they sought spiritual and worldly guidance. It was he, Samuel who was leader of Israel until now. But Samuel 
in his anger and disappointment had to oversee the transformation. It must have been torturous for him. He will serve God though as well as he can, as well as he could. Samuel sought out Saul with God's guidance. As we've said, um, Samuel um, would be the, God, uh, the king that the Israelites deserved. His reign would prove disastrous. Samuel's faithful fellowship of God, uh, God's will eventually saw him anoint Saul as the, uh, the king. But to be fair, we must remember that this decision, God knew was in the plan, the redemptive plan, because one day a true godly king, David, would be crowned. Not perfect by any means, but a king blessed by God, under whose reign the people would also be blessed. It's important, isn't it, to look at the application uh, in these things. Uh, in these passages that we read, how do we apply this? Well, Samuel was greatly disappointed to hear what the people were asking for. He went to God. He went down on his knees and prayed to his Lord. Our first port of call, I don't need to tell you this, you know it, but our first port of call should always be God. Go to the throne of grace place our troubles before God. That's what Samuel did. And secondly, in his disappointment, despite Samuel knowing that the people were rejecting God and him, he faithfully and conscientiously puts God's plan into effect. He does not go his own way. He does not follow his own path or go off on a frolic of his own. He puts into effect God's plan. Why does he do that? Well, it's interesting. This is the second time that Jason's sermon uh, at the, uh, or talk at the men's breakfast has been mentioned. Tim mentioned it last week. And on a similar point, this is Samuel's response and an example of agape love. Samuel's response is a sacrificial response, burying his own pride and showing his love and obedience to his God. Amen. Well, we will conclude our service uh, with a final song, How Deep the Father's Love.
Let's close uh, our service in prayer. Oh Lord, we thank you so much for the words of wisdom that we find in this, your book. We thank you for the example of Samuel, a great man of the Old Testament, a sinner not perfect by any means, only the Lord Jesus Christ is perfect. But Samuel was obedient to you. We see in his life an example of that love for his God. So Lord, as we go into a new week, we thank you once again for your word and ask that we are led by it this week uh, in our relationships with others, in the things that we say and the things that we do. Bless us this week, we pray, in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.